let's interpret some of this stuff now because that's really where it where it, where it matters is sure it's easy enough to follow these formulas and plug numbers in and get and get an answer but that's the easy part interpretation well that's where you become an expert so let's interpret our price variance versus our quantity variance and you're going to see that as we go through this there's a lot of trade-offs that can be made so let's look at our materials how can we generate a price variance in materials well uh, we can experience either a lower or higher cost than what our standard was we might have a standard price and suddenly we find that the prices have dropped or the prices have risen for a quantity variance we might use more or less uh, in, in terms of waste and rejects we might be having a good week and there's very little waste or very few rejects it could be that we buy a lower or let's see, differentiate it here with a different color a higher quality of input we can get a better price by buying a lower quality achieve a positive price variance but lower quality may be more and a higher quality may result in less waste or rejects we can get a lower quality material get a positive price variance but that material would end up with more waste and rejects thereby getting a negative quantity variance so there's trade-offs to be made between price and quantity let's look at labor let's see what happens here and we're just going to go on one side here how we can get positive or favorable variances well we can get a favorable price variance with a lower cost per hour instead of hiring very experienced people at twenty dollars let's hire some people at fifteen hey i win uh, lower payroll taxes sometimes to stimulate the economy and, and to encourage hiring the government will uh, give a, a deal to corporations that hey for a while uh, your payroll taxes are going to be significantly lower a quantity variance could be negative well less experienced workers more rejects All right it takes them longer to do something they they mess up more often uh, well if we have poor quality material maybe we don't have more rejects but it might require more processing time or a lack of demand think about that a lack of demand how can we get a quantity variance from a lack of demand well if the number of output if the number of units drops significantly it will look like we have a quantity variance especially if we don't adjust our labor force to output it'll look like we have a negative quantity variance when actually it's just a drop in demand that will correspond with an increase in inventory so that that will at least have some clue that that's what the case is for variable overhead how do we get price variances well the same way with the materials right higher or lower costs it might be a terribly cold winter and your heating expense is going to be higher than than what the standard was well it's not a standard winter so that's fully explainable but it's still a variance right more or less of the quantity used for a quantity variance here is where you have to be careful there is no quantity variance in variable overhead you have efficiencies and inefficiencies in the use of the base so if you use more labor hours than what the standard is then it'll look like you have a quantity variance in variable overhead but it doesn't have anything to do with overhead it has to do with inefficiencies or efficiencies in the use of the base so let's make a note here the interpretation of the quantity variance for variable overhead depends on the cost driver that's used it depends on the cost driver here we're using direct labor hours so this variance says something about direct labor hours not about overhead depends on the cost driver used being the actual cost driver and if it is then it says something about direct labor hours or machine hours or whatever your cost driver is it doesn't say anything about the variable overhead itself that we find in the price variance so let's go through some examples of uh, how we can trace variances uh, through our three manufacturing costs and what I have here is I have the 
direct materials, uh, direct labor, and variable manufacturing overhead broken down into how we would achieve the price variance, the quantity variance for direct materials, the rate variance and the efficiency variance for direct labor, and the spending variance and the efficiency variance for variable manufacturing overhead. And let's go through an example to look at the dependencies uh, among these three accounts. So have a look over here. Number one, let's start by buying lower quality raw materials. If we do that, we will achieve a favorable price variance. Well, that's a good thing. Well, let's see how good it is. I always say that cheap is probably the most expensive thing you'll ever buy, and let me show you why. Number two, if we have a lower quality raw material, chances are we're going to have more waste and rejects. Anyone who's ever built a deck uh, on their house and goes to Home Depot knows that you better look at those uh, those, those uh, pieces of lumber that you buy because if you buy one that's warped and naughty you're just gonna have to throw it out uh, so you'll have more waste and rejects so you'll end up with an unfavorable quantity variance but it doesn't end there workers spend more time working around the flaws in the material and they spend more time uh, completing a finished good that might later have to be rejected because a flaw didn't quite show up when they were handling the material. So you'll end up, number three, with an unfavorable efficiency variance because they're spending more time to do the same output. Well, we're not done. Since variable manufacturing overhead is composed of some variable rate times your direct labor hours. An unfavorable labor efficiency variance equals an unfavorable variable manufacturing overhead efficiency variance. Number four, unfavorable. We're still not done. There is another possible uh, problem here. If in fact our variable manufacturing overhead, if in fact it does vary with labor hours. More labor hours will mean more spending. Not just a bad efficiency variance, but also more spending. If it doesn't vary so much with direct labor hours, we'd still have the inefficiency, uh, or sorry, an, an unfavorable efficiency ratio, but maybe not a spending variance. And if we don't, then that tells us that our cost driver is not really the right cost driver. But let's assume that it is. So we spend more hours doing what we have to do for the same output. Chances are you're also going to get an unfavorable spending variance. So achieving a favorable price variance by buying a lower grade raw material or a cheaper input can cascade throughout the entire system. One of the uh, things when I used to teach entrepreneurship courses, I used to tell aspiring entrepreneurs, never hire a cheap lawyer. Always hire the most expensive lawyer. When you hire a cheap lawyer, you'll probably lose, which means you'll not only pay for your lawyer, but you got to pay for the other side's lawyer and you'll lose, making it more expensive than if you had gotten the expensive lawyer because an expensive lawyer is intimidating to the other side and knows how to shut this down faster than a cheap lawyer. Pay the $800 an hour, you'll spend four hours. You get the $200 an hour lawyer, you'll be 30 hours and you'll lose. Cheap is not cheap. Cheap is cheap for a reason. You buy cheap materials, look what happens. Now here's the thing. Let's say that uh, you're a manager and you didn't know all of this stuff down here and you just had to look at all of these uh, variances and you have a bunch of unfavorable variances. You might be uh, apt to blame labor. You might say your labor is too inefficient, you're wasting too many materials, and you're resulting in an unfavorable uh, variance in var variable manufacturing overhead. You have to be able to have the experience to trace it, through to, uh, to trace it through and say, you know what, it's not labor that's at fault here. You're trying to cheapen the material by buying a lower quality input, which is causing all of this to happen. If this is your new standard for your input, you need new quantity standards, new labor standards, and new variable overhead standards. So the standard, when we have a standard for the price, this part of the standard for the price includes a certain grade or quality of raw material. If you depart from that standard, then all these other standards are meaningless. Uh, or at least uh, you, the, the managers in each section should not be held to those standards. 
In this example, we're going to start with the first uh, decision in labor instead of materials. We're going to hire some less experienced workers so we can pay them less. And we're going to try to save money here. So we have a favorable rate variance. But they take longer to complete tasks. And if they take longer to complete tasks, that will result in an unfavorable efficiency variance. Further, they make more mistakes, which results in more waste and more rejects, so you will have an unfavorable quantity variance. Well, going back to the second one, the uh, unfavorable efficiency variance, more direct labor hours worked equals an unfavorable manufacturing overhead efficiency variance, since, of course, it's part of uh, calculating the total. So, number four over here, you will have an unfavorable efficiency variance. So, looking at these uh, uh, results, would you say that, well, bravo for the uh, hiring manager uh, or uh, the personnel manager. You've done a great job in controlling our costs, but the production manager, you got a big problem. The production manager would come back and say, look, it's not my problem. You need to, to recruit and hire people that can do the job. These people cannot do the job, and that's what's causing this. Uh, you may also look at the production manager in terms of quantity, saying you're using far too much material in what you're doing. You're inefficient. This, the, the uh, uh, step number one, hiring less experienced workers, cascades into these other variances, into these other exceptions. So again, let me repeat, when you find a variance, that doesn't mean that the problem lies there. You may have to trace it through the system to find the original source. Here was a deviation from the standard. The standard probably called for a certain amount of hours by a certain type of employee, a certain type of quality of knowledge of employee. Departing from that standard ruins all the other standards. So when you have standard costing, whenever you depart anywhere from a standard, it ruins all the other standards. And finally, in our last example, why don't we try a, a positive story? So step number one, the uh, company implements a skill enhancement training program. And let's say that it's ongoing so that when we calculate our labor rate, we'll put the cost of the skills enhancement in with the labor rate so that we would achieve, number one, an unfavorable rate variance. We're, we're knowingly going to increase our labor costs by implementing the skills enhancement training program. Not only is there the cost of the program, but as our workers become more and more skilled, they become more valuable to our competitors. So to keep them, we have to continually reward them uh, with, uh, with a higher salary uh, to, keep them, to keep them where they belong. Well, what happens here? Well, workers become more productive. If they're not becoming more productive, then obviously you're not enhancing skills very much. Workers become more productive, and they can possibly discover some process innovations where they can change the standard. So instead of three and a half hours per unit, um, they, they may be able to do it in three hours per unit with the skills enhancement, plus discover some time-saving techniques that brings it down even more to two and a half hours per unit. So you will end up with a favorable efficiency variance. Not only that, more productive workers that are more skilled result in higher quality work, so you have less waste and rejects. So you would end up with a favorable quantity variance. Well, look over here on number two. Recall that when this was unfavorable, our efficiency variance for variable manufacturing overhead was also unfavorable. But when we achieve a, a favorable labor efficiency variance, fewer hours for the same output, we also achieve a favorable efficiency variance. So spending some money on training, uh, on skills enhancement, can pay dividends in uh, uh, your efficiency, your labor efficiency uh, rate. So you'll achieve a, a favorable efficiency variance. You can reduce the amount of waste and rejects and improve the quality, actually the quality of the existing products and your labor, your manufacturing overhead, the variable portion, uh, achieves a favorable efficiency variance as well. So we can see that none of these cells, these six cells, none of these cells are an island. 
It's not as if one thing happens in, in one category or a decision uh, is made to depart from a standard in one category that won't cascade throughout the entire system. These standards are tied and interdependent. That's, uh, that's something that uh, um, we have to realize when we implement a standard costing system is that you must stick with the standards after. Now, I'm going to go ahead and, and jump ahead just a bit here. That's also noted as a disadvantage of standard costing is that once the standards are in place, there's very little motivation to depart from the standard because of these interdependencies. So it may actually hinder innovation and creativity and improvement because if it's not part of the standard and, and if management is rewarded by sticking to the standard and not departing from the standard, then uh, there could be a downside to that. We'll talk more about that later, but there we go. That's uh, some good walkthroughs uh, for understanding the dependencies uh, in the variances across the, the cost categories. Mm -hmm.